Hear the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Told you Jesus is saying some mighty strange things today. But despite that, this is still the good news, the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. I came to bring fire to the earth. Do you think that I came to bring peace? No, I tell you, rather division. Do these pronouncements out of Jesus' mouth today surprise you, confuse you, annoy you? <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I can't help but puzzle over these statements because they just don't fit with the image they, that I have of Jesus. You know, of Jesus as this, this gentle, this, this compassionate, this, this reasonable guy this teacher who is always so patient with everybody and always so kind. And I bet you too think of Jesus as the good shepherd with a little lamb nestled in his arms before you think of him as a raving lunatic threatening a deadly firestorm and announcing great divisions. Divisions? We, we would think that with all the divisiveness that we witness in our world today, it seems to me like the last thing we need is a gospel text that seemingly encourages more division. This is just not so the nice and gentle Jesus that I want. Back in the 1970s, actually maybe it was the late 60s, the musical Jesus Christ Superstar appeared on the scene. Maybe you remember it if you're old enough when that came along, you know, Jesus Christ, superstar, da 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 but You remember that? Yeah. In my humble opinion, it's one of the greatest rock operas ever. Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote the music. I mean, how could you go on with him? The lyrics are by Tim Rice. And if you're my age, you'll remember what a scandal that musical was. How much people were upset about it because, you know, actually the main character wasn't Jesus. It was Judas, one of the 12 disciples, part of Jesus' inner circle, and he was the main protagonist of the rock opera. He was originally played by Ben Vereen. Judas, of course, over the centuries has gotten a pretty bad rap as the one who betrayed Jesus, right? the one who sold him out for 30 silver pieces, the one who later regretted this cho his choices and went and hanged himself. He's made out to be the bad guy in the gospel narratives, so much so that in John's gospel, John can't help himself but to make a snide side remark telling us that Judith would take money from the common purse of the disciples and that he was a thief on top of being a traitor. But see, in Jesus Christ Superstar, and this is what surprised people so much, Judas is portrayed in a much kinder light. Here in the musical, Judas is a zealot 
and a revolutionary who has bought into the notion that Jesus is the promised Messiah who has come to liberate the Jewish nation and to kick out the hated Roman occupiers once and for all. Now, in the face of it, that wasn't all that radical at the time. I mean, people then, that was the mainstream of what people thought the Messiah was going to be and do. But for Judas, Jesus was the real thing. But then when Jesus takes a whole new direction and now starts talking about suffering and death, about sacrificing his life, about how he has to go up to Jerusalem and do all that, that's when he loses Judas, right? So when Jesus sets his face on Jerusalem in Luke's telling, Judas gets increasingly frustrated and angry and he ends up betraying Jesus as a way to force him to be more militant. See, it's this militant side of Jesus we get to witness in today's gospel reading and no doubt Judas would have liked the way Jesus is talking here. I came to bring fire to the earth. Do you think that I came to bring peace? No, no. I came to bring division. Makes me think of the terrible wildfires that are raging literally all over the earth as a result of climate change. We hear about wildfires out west all the time, of course, but, you know, in Europe there are several wildfires going on as we speak. Jesus, of course, is speaking metaphorically, and he goes on to say that his message will be divisive, that, that whole families will be divided because of him, father against son, and son against father, and daughter against mother, and mother against daughter, and so, so on, two against three, and three against one. Well, in a certain way, you could say that Jesus is predicting here what actually then happened and what we have seen throughout the history of the Christian church. The Christian church has never been united. It's always been divided. Division and strife, disagreement and violence, even war, is what the Christian history has been about from the very beginning. The young church devolved into conflict as the early Christians in Jerusalem feuded with the followers of Paul over the question of circumcision, circumcision, I can't even say it, and whether or not you had to become a Jew first before you could become a Christian. Then in the fourth century, we get what theologians call the Christological controversies. That is the question of whether Jesus was human or divine. And again, you had bishops and priests and church leaders arguing on both sides of the issue until the Roman emperor forced them to make a decision because by then Christianity was becoming the state religion of the empire. And then for more than a thousand years, church and state ended up being intertwined so much that bishops and archbishops and the pope were exercising worldly power, fighting wars, killing untold millions in crusades and religious wars. In the 17th century, Catholics and Lutherans were killing each other in the Thirty Years' War. And even today, right, Christianity is splintered into a thousand groups and churches and denominations and sects. I think Jesus was right. He brought division. He brought fire on the earth. Amy Chill Levin, a Jewish scholar at the Vanderbilt University Divinity School in Nashville, she, she says it this way in her new book, The Misunderstood Jew. Today, Jesus' words are too familiar, too domesticated, too stripped of their initial edginess and urgency. Only when heard through first century Jewish ears can their original edginess and urgency be recovered edginess and urgency. That's what I hear in Jesus' words today. So, so what of the gentle, the, the kind Jesus, you know, the nice one? <laughs> Where's the good shepherd in all of this? Did Jesus really say all this? And, and why Jesus uses this particular occasion to say these rather controversial things isn't quite clear. Right before our text, 
he discusses faithfulness. And right after, he talks about settling disputes and he talks about forgiveness of all things. It, it's almost like all this talk about fire and division is kind of, kind of sandwiched between kind of things that the gentle Jesus said. Some Bible interpreters think that, that maybe these particular sayings are a kind of a collection of things Jesus said here or there in other contexts that maybe Luke collected them all and put them in this one chapter, maybe to just get done with it and move on. Or, or maybe Jesus just had a bad day and needed to unload his frustration, or perhaps he was calculating that he needed to shake up his movement and push the disciples out of their complacency by using rather incendiary language. At our Bible study on Wednesday night, Lisa Dove said, as much when she speculated that maybe Jesus wanted to dislodge the stagnant behavior of his audience. That's how she put it. And you know, that's as good an explanation as any that I've read in any of the commentaries on this text. The historical Jesus, of course, is both. Jesus is both the radical teacher who challenges us with words like today, and Jesus is the gentle the good shepherd who comforts us. You've heard, I'm sure, the claim that the gospel confronts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. The quote, to be honest with you, actually goes back to journalist Finley Peter Dunn. It had nothing to do with the gospel. Uh, he used it, he had one of his cartoon characters say this about the role of newspapers. There was a newspaper's role through their stories to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. But you could say that of Jesus, and you could say that of the gospel's message, and perhaps our text today is meant to afflict those of us who are too comfortable and who need a bit of shaking up. Let's be honest, we are all very comfortable, most of us at least, at least in an economic sense. Last week I told you that there's a website that claims that Kerry is now the number one richest town in America today. There are three billionaires that live in Kerry with a combined net worth of $15 billion. But of course, being afflicted and being comfortable are not mutually exclusive, right? This isn't an either-or proposition. Rather, in good Lutheran fashion, this is a both-and kind of a thing. I mean, as comfortable as our lives might have become, we're also afflicted by health concerns, by failing health maybe, by broken relationships in our families, by addiction to meds and drugs and yes, money, by stress at work and trouble at home. See, just as Martin Luther tells us that we are both saints and sinners at the very same time, so we hear Jesus' word today, both as those who are comfortable and need to be shaken out of our complacency, and as people who need comfort in the midst of affliction. And, and of course, let's tell the truth, the greatest affliction awaiting us and that applies to all of us without exception, however comfortable we may be, is the inevitable death that awaits every single one of us sooner or later. So here's another way to, to look at this text. David Lowe's, one of my go-to commentators, points out that fire, you know, is a common image in the Bible, and it's used in many different ways. Often fire represents the presence of God. You know, think of the pillars of fire, right, that lead the people of Israel through the desert at night. Or, or think of the flames of fire that come over the apostles at Pentecost. You know, think of the burning bush when Moses meets God in fire. Fire can also stand for judgment, eschatological judgment, judgment at the end times, for example, in Revelation, Satan and his armies are consumed by fire in the final battle between good and evil. And thirdly, fire can stand for purification. 
Zechariah and Malachi both refer to God's intention to purify Israel like a refiner purifies silver. So baptism, with then Jesus starts talking about too, baptism is used in the New Testament to represent both judgment and purification. John the Baptist makes that connection when he says that he baptizes with water, but the one that's coming is going to baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. And so you could say that our text today really points to the division that is the result of this purifying fire that Jesus has promised. David Lowes then goes on to say, the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaims represents a new order governed not by might, but by forgiveness, not by fear, but by courage, and not by power, but by humility. Yet those invested in the present order, he goes on to say, those invested in the present order, those lured by the temptations of wealth, status, and power, and those who rule now will resist the coming kingdom for it spells an end to what they know and love, or at least have grown accustomed to. That's why there will be division, Lowe says. Divisions that reach even into the most intimate and personal of relationships, those among family. Then Jesus goes on in the second part of the gospel lesson to talk about the weather <laughs> and, and how people know what to expect. When you see a cloud, he says, rising in the west, you immediately say, well, it's going to rain. And when you see the south wind blowing, well, then you say, there is going to be a scorcher. You're hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know to interpret the present time? Well, you know, on the face of it, Jesus is right, of course. The, the people of his time didn't need weather.com to figure out what to expect. The Mediterranean Sea was to the west, so the winds from there would bring rain and moisture. The desert was to the south, so when the winds were blowing from that direction, guess what? It was going to be hot. But Jesus isn't talking about the weather here, not really. He's talking about discerning the signs of the time and to decide what action Jesus' followers must take to advance the kingdom of God, how they need to respond to whatever is going on around them. That, of course, is an important question not just for the disciples of Jesus at that time, but for us today as well. How do we, as people of God in this place, interpret what is going on around us? How do we respond to human suffering, to the injustices that we encounter, to the systemic oppression that we see around us? To what do we pay attention and to what do we turn a blind eye? Pastor Eric Thompson, in his commentary on Luther Seminary's Working Preacher website, says it this way. Why do we insist on pretending to ignore the injustices, racial and otherwise, around us? Most likely the answer is that we don't want to see what's really happening or our role in the injustices of the world. There is clearly an opportunity to talk about the elephant in the room for many contexts. And he goes on, simply naming an issue might be gospel for many, and maybe that chirotic event that changes everything. But it might lead to division. We have to trust that God is at work in all situations, and remember that God has claimed us in our baptism, not because we've been perfect Christians. So there's your answer, right? In baptism, God has claimed us. In baptism, God calls us. In baptism, God gives us faith so we can live in newness of life and advance God's kingdom in all that we do and all that we say. Our second lesson today from Hebrews, we read about the power of faith and how faith has enabled the people of God to do the impossible 
By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea, we read there. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish. By faith, Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all of those prophets conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Man, that is quite a list. Conquered kingdoms, quenched raging fires, shut the mouths of lions. I like that. Quite a list. The good news. People of God, the good news for us today is that it is that very faith that made these people do all these wonderful things. That very faith that we receive in baptism that makes us strong, that gives us courage, that calls us to bind up the brokenhearted and stand up for justice and peace. Martin Luther had this to say about this God-given faith that makes us so strong. Faith is a living, a daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man, that a person, would stake their life on it a thousand times. This confidence of God's grace and knowledge of it makes us glad and bold and happy in dealing with God and with all creatures. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in faith. That's the answer, siblings in Christ. That's the answer because the Holy Spirit is with us and in us and in faith, we are literally on fire for Jesus. And the Spirit's passion and compassion leads us to set the whole world on fire with the grace and the love and the mercy of God. And that, dear people of God, is the good news for you this morning. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.